Um, a little bit about me. Um, obviously, my name is Thomas Cho. Um, I graduated from the University of Texas in Austin in 2004. Um, Longhorn, I, I studied engineering, worked as an engineer for five years of my life. I went back to school because engineering was not for me. And um, I studied obviously marketing strategy. I got my MBA at Vanderbilt University, it's a small university out in Nashville, Tennessee. Nobody on the West Coast knows it. But um, I moved out here to Los Angeles, um, you know, manifest destiny with a dream to like just to be on the West Coast. It's probably like the most progressive place that I've lived in my life. I've lived in six cities since uh, I graduated college. And hands down, it's probably my favorite uh, city. I love coffee. Um, I will do uh, any light roast from Burundi. Um, I love pasta, both making and eating it, but prefer to eat it, definitely. And um, I think, again, like Los Angeles, um, I feel so blessed to be here with you guys. Um, went through that. I've had the opportunity to work with some great brands, some brands that you guys probably know. Um, I started initially after graduate school, I started in like product management, worked in CPG marketing, which is a very like, classical and traditional way to market. Um, I naturally moved over to where I think the industry is going towards like advertising and like brand marketing. Um, currently, I work at Yamaha, but in the past, like worked with um, Apple and Beats. So my colleagues over here from Beats that we had some amazing times together. Um, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about product. Um, product. We can define product as an article of substance that is manufactured for sale, that's refined for sale. Um, if you think about it, like going way, way back, back then, like there was no like type of exchange other than like the bartering system. So people took um, people took literally products and traded them for other products. Now with the government, governments getting involved, they invented a currency, they invented coin. So now we exchange products for coin. Um, what we see, like before the invention of, of cash, that bartering system was that exchange for goods. Um, now products are obviously not just solid products that you buy, but services that companies provide you. So whether it's a service, whether it's a packaged good, whether it's a subscription, you pay for some type of service, what's considered now a product. Um, to kind of dumb things down and to simplify things, let's use a toothbrush and like identify how com com different companies will like market, sell, they'll operate, produce, um, and literally advertise um, a toothbrush. And we both look at, at an old traditional approach, what you might see at a CPG company versus like a more modern company like a startup and how they would look at a toothbrush. So we can look at it from a few different angles, um, product design, organization, leadership, marketing, growth, and innovation. Um, from a traditional perspective, you'll see these traditional CPG companies and more antiquated companies like look at very process oriented when it comes to product design. So there's a stage gate process that you follow. It's got to go by this certain person, that certain person. It's got to follow these procedures um, versus like a startup where they're more innovation oriented. Let's get this product out. Let's make it as cheap as possible. Let's like build the, the cheapest product that's feasible for our consumer. Um, you look at organization. Traditional organizations are more about employing people to build something. So for the toothbrush, you might have a manager that works specifically on the bristles and that tries to make the bristles better year over year. So your version 2.0 is just a toothbrush with the better bristles. You might also have a manager that works on the handle that tries to make the handle more uh, ergonomical versus an organization that is more of a startup feel. They're going to be focused on performance. What's working, what's not. Like who's delivering better marketing, who's creating this operation or creating a process that's better for that organization. Um, leadership typically in older organizations are sales focused versus more modern organizations are both sales and marketing. Because this is the way that we market to our consumer, we want our product to be obviously front and center. So marketing and sales is a very, a very big priority for startup organizations. Um, again, marketing, we can do product feature marketing, talking about what product, what, what these bristles are made of versus who buys my product. Is it a Steph Curry that buys this type of toothbrush or is it a LeBron that buys this type of toothbrush. And that way you have an identity to your brand, to your product. Um, lastly, or second to last is growth. Traditional organizations look at sales growth and um, more modern organizations look at social growth so they can expand their reach. And lastly, from an innovation perspective, um, a traditional organization will look to make the best toothbrush year over year as opposed to more startups. They're looking to like eliminating dentists or going to orthodontia. Um, the reason I bring up 
like the mindset of the organizations is because I think in traditional organizations, you'll rarely see huge disruption. You'll rarely see huge evolution. Um, it's usually step by step. This year, we're going to add a fifth wheel. This year, we're going to add another stick shift. This year, we're going to add another gear. Whereas like startup organizations, they have the nimbleness, they have the dexterity, they have that kind of creative mindset of, hey, let's create something and like pr make it increment, not incrementally better, but monumentally better. And so like from traditional organizations, they typically traditional organizations need to shift into that mindset to survive or they naturally go bankrupt. Um, what's awesome about, I guess, this world is with mergers and acquisitions, you can have traditional organizations that just purchase these startups and have that as their kind of incubative arm. Um, so just to dive into history, and I think when ideas and, pro and products reach the masses, when they're completely like democratized to the masses, and these are like, whether it's technology, whether it's service, this is when you start to see like disruption in an industry. Um, this goes for anything, just information, design, aesthetic design, industrial design, um, transportation. Um, so if we take a quick look at history, we can see like what products have helped like proliferate ideas and spread those ideas to the masses. Does anybody know what this is? Um, who knows what came from this, the Model T Ford? That's, that's one of them. Anybody else? Assembly line. Why was the assembly line super important? Scale quickly. What else, what also did it do in addition to scale? Sure. And what did that do to cost? Drove down cost. So if you take the Model T Ford, I think before they had the assembly line, it was tens of thousands of dollars, which was obviously unattainable for the mass uh, consumer, but with the assembly line, it, I think it dropped down below seven thousand dollars. And what did that do for just in general for consumers? You could travel more, you could share ideas more, you could buy things, you could trade more, you could exchange a lot of more things. And so, like this liquidity in terms of like idea exchange became a lot more accessible, which obviously um, changed the time and like stirred the economy. Um, moving to black what they call Black Tuesday, the stock market crash of 1929. Um, this was, this was a, this uh, was a, a really, I think, troubling time for, for products because um, obviously the need for like design, the need for uh, products was not as important as the essentials that you had. So because I just needed to purchase something, whether it was food or bread, I didn't care what it was, I just needed to buy the cheapest to feed my family. And the same went for like cars, the same went for toothbrushes and everything that in that time. So the Great Depression kind of erased the need for any type of desirable lifestyle. Um, sorry, my, these notes are hard to read. Um, and it wasn't until like mid-century when we went to mid-century design where we resaw a lot of this design innovation. Obviously, we had two world wars in between. Uh, 19, 1908 and 1946, but it was actually the Eames and mid-century architecture that helped mold and reintroduce that need. Um, at the time, design was the idea that was democratized and that was shared around, uh, shared with the mass population. But now we can look at this technology and this democratization of product design, um, how it's really changed culture and really affected history, um, both from a revolutionary sense. Sorry. Um, Apologize, it's not in the slide. Um, let's move on to communication. Um, in the past 10, 15 years, communication has evolved so fast and so rapidly. Um, probably, it's probably one of our best places to understand disruption, where disruption is going. Um, with the advent of the radio, the advent of the TV, obviously the World Wide Web, the iPhone, things evolved from radio to TV. Nobody thought the radio will die. Nobody thinks that the TV will die. Nobody thinks that the internet will die. Nobody thinks the iPhone will die. So with that, communication obviously is more social. 
Um, the way children are communicating are not through phone calls, not through meeting in person. They type a text, they, they send an emoji, now it's an, an emoji. And I hate to say it, but it's the brands that begin to pioneer in these spaces, whether it's AR, whether it's VR, whether it's um, talking to consumers at a, I guess, a dumber level when it comes to texts and emojis that are going to win the game in terms of marketing and reaching consumers because they're on that level of communication where all the children are and all the kids are. So shifting over to brand um, really quickly because I think that space is something that's continuing to evolve. Currently, we're in a very traditional marketing organization. We see, all right, these product features. Now we're seeing kind of a brand identity develop from this is a product to this is a brand, this is an identity I associate with, and therefore I'm, I want to buy it. Um, Technology advancement can be evolutionary, but it's, I think, marketing that's going to really evolve once um, and, and really disrupt the space because brands resonate with people more so than products do. So let's talk a little bit about this company. Um, it's a, it was a really interesting climate. I joined Beats in 2012. This is when Monster kind of... Uh, owned most of the operation. They owned retail, point of sale. They took, they took the headphone and sold it into different retail stores. Um, at the time, it was roughly a $150 million market when Beats entered the space. Obviously, it's grown considerably amount. Beats was purchased in 2015 for over $3 billion. Um, but looking at the, the market, the, both own the market. They own 25% of the market, and the rest of the 75% of the market was owned by numerous of brands, Sony, Sennheiser, JBL. Um, and at the time, there was kind of one's perspective towards headphones. There was, in terms of marketing as well, like, hey, we have the best noise cancellation. We have the best sound. We have this type of hi-fi capability. We use these types of wires. There was no, it was, it was not very diverse in thought. And so Beats came into the space, and what Jimmy and Dre do, did they saw the insights of what happened out of the iPod. They saw, okay, people are buying the iPod. People are wearing these, these earbuds, and they, th those earbuds represented something. So when you saw somebody with white earbuds in their ears, oh, this person not only loves music, but they identify with different artists. They identify not just with the quality of sound, um, but they identify more so with the, the, the purpose of music, the meaning of music, the, the issues that music brought, the culture that it surrounded. And so... With the industry like moving, moving towards like democratized or like proliferated media where you had like MP3s being ripped on, on Napster and be easily shared, um, Dre and Jimmy, they, dis they discovered that like, okay, we need to shift our model from just running a music label to producing something else. And where I think Beats really won outside of like intercepting Nike and Adidas in the sports realm, where I think Beats really won was when they started not just selling a product, but they started selling a service. So you bought the headphones, but also you subscribed to Beats Music, which was a service that got bought by Apple Music. Um, what our advertising did at Beats wasn't necessarily talk about like the best quality, uh, didn't talk about the sound, didn't talk about noise cancellation, which were still parts of the headphones and the products that we created. But it's still, it talked to like, what the stories are of these people who would wear beats. Like, would you identify with a certain character who played this and wore this certain headphone? Or would you identify with, um, would you identify with uh, another character who's like, trying to achieve their best through this headphone? Um, so it, our mantra behind the storytelling be at Beats was, was really about storytelling and rising heroes that, that created an identity at Beats. Um, often we're asked, and this is a, is a, is a question of like, is, was Beats an evolution or was it a disruption? And we can debate, this is something that's easily debated. Um, I think like evolution is something that's going to grow stage gate process wise, it's going to grow incrementally versus a disruption which is going to grow overnight. Um, and we look to certain brands, we can look at other brands um, like Dyson, Uber, Amazon, Bitcoin, and like Netflix. Some brands that I can resonate, some companies that I can resonate. But my question is to you, like, which of these do you think are more disruptive or more evolutionary? Bud Dyson, anybody? 
Why is it evolutionary? It's still basically, a, it's a better vacuum. It's a better toothbrush, right? It's building on the features, it's, it's growing it, but it's still something you push around that sucks up dirty from the ground. Okay. Anybody else? Uber? Disruptive. disruptive. Why is it disruptive? First global ride sharing company. Right. It pretty much took over the taxi market. Where are taxis now? Um, it probably grew uh, the, the existing market far bigger than what it was at the time. Amazon? Disruptive. Could you say it's also evolutionary as well? Yeah. yeah. Um, everybody knew digital was the, the platform that people were going to buy things on. Amazon just happened to dominate that space. Um, I think what they're doing with Fresh, what they're doing with uh, delivery, like maybe that's revolutionary, maybe that's disruptive because nobody, nobody could do that in the past. Um, Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is like I think when they started to introduce like coin and exchange and monetary and, and created this idea of currency, um, that was government trying to control the system, trying to like take the arbitrage of selling three fish for one bear skin out of the game and saying, hey, we're going to have that arbitrage opportunity. We're going to take that over. But Bitcoin is kind of that defiant sense of like, hey, nobody else can operate this except people online. And lastly, Netflix. What do you guys think? Disruptive. Disruptive? Not, not, not evolutionary? Um, Netflix is an interesting one, I think, because uh, for me, it's a streaming service that you purchase, but now they have a whole bunch of brands, a skew of brands that, like Stranger Things, that you can buy from. You can buy Stranger Things Monopoly. So it, it was a service subscription organization that's shifting over into a product mindset space. So I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, consumer values today. Uh, because of what we've seen with mobile handheld devices, namely the iPhone, um, I think like access to information, access to design, access to the internet, and proliferation of like social ideas um, on the internet, consumers are asking more. They're asking for more technology. They're asking for better products. They're asking for better services with these following things. Um, obviously, industrial design is important. So when Apple launched the iPod, it was such a simple device. Do you guys remember MP3 players? Are you guys old enough to remember that? Um, I had one of those. I had a mini disc player, too. They were shit. Like, you had 10 buttons on them. But the iPod, it, it was so simple. You had a swivel wheel. You had a, a center wheel. Did it have a volume up and volume down on the iPad, on the iPod? Regardless, that user experience, that user interface for the iPod was extremely clean. So from that, I think consumers now demand that that's part of the game. Moreover, I think consumers associate that product and that, that product quality, or, or assume product quality is associated to user experience and user interface. Um, obviously, it's got to be something that's desirable as, and, a, and describes like an aspirational lifestyle that you want to, to live and wear. Um, for me, like brands that I associate with are like, okay, I identify with them, so therefore I will buy them. Versus uh, this is just a commodity that I use, like a toothbrush. I don't identify with Crest or Colgate. I'll just buy whatever toothbrush Costco sells because to me it's a commodity. I'll just purchase it. Um, On-demand economy. This is the age of swiping right to get laid, you know, double tapping to liking and you, whatever it is. This is the age of I want it now, I want it fast. So like the Amazon Primes of the world that will deliver things or the Amazon Now of the world that will deliver things to you, to your doorstep in two hours are going to be the ones that, that win. Uh-oh, there we go. And lastly, content is king. The brands, the companies that start delivering amazing content obviously grab your attention. And the way Beats approaches it, the way Nike, the way I think these big brands approach things is um, let's be in the, let's just be in the mind space of a consumer before they're even ready to purchase. Let's create content so that consumers come to us for content so that when they're ready to purchase, um, they'll, they'll look to our company. The reason I say these things is because these are like qualifiers to what disruptive brands do and disruptive pro product companies do. So without these things, it's, I think it's, it's hard to become disruptive. Um, there's some identifiable factors uh, I've, I've seen in the industry that, that, are, uh, that show the like ripening of industries. Um, these kind of point towards triggers that can like 
that might be a precursor to, to disruption or a disruptive industry. Um, evolving media platforms. When you see media evolving so fast and technology moving so fast, once it hits like kind of its plateau and sits, some, I think something's going to happen there. Something usually erupts. Um, and same thing with that evolving consumer or the customer. So you see, now we talk about the rise of women, the rise of minorities. Um, that once they've kind of hit their peak, once they start to plateau, you'll see, a lot, I think, a lot of disruption in the market in terms of what they want to purchase. Um, accessibility to retail and e-tail in a globalized economy. Naturally, that's huge. That's the Amazon Prime. You can buy anything, anywhere, anytime. Um, that's obviously going to change the industry. A sea of commodities. Um, this is what we call a red ocean, I guess, business strategy. But this is where you have a whole bunch of different things that have no brand identity to them. So you just go out and purchase whatever's the cheapest. When you have a category that has a sea of commodities, you'll definitely see uh, disruption in that industry. I think iHome, so the iHome that they're going to release soon, the iHome is going to do that for the, the wireless home, uh, wireless audio in your home. So like traditional like receivers and stereos, we're going to shift towards um, obviously a different experience because we are in a sea of commodities. And lastly, homogenous viewpoints, design, and lack of industrial design. Um, when you see that in an industry, whether it's shoes, whether it's fashion, whether it's clothes, when you see everything kind of converging, there's going to be one outlier that's going to stick out and disrupt the industry. Um, this is kind of just thoughts I put out there. Uh, I'd like to open up the questions. Initially, I wanted just to have it an open discussion, but um, do you guys have any questions? Where, where do you guys think that the industry is going to go? Where do you think like, the next disruption is going to happen? Obviously, like, artificial intelligence, AR, VR is, is a, big issue, a big thing right now with Amazon Alexa, Google Home. Um, I think the auto industry is, is pretty interesting in terms of disruption. You see a lot of uh, self-driving cars. You also see like, big purchases in the auto industry. A car is not cheaper than, what, $20,000, $30,000? So when does that shift into a service where you buy on-demand ride sharing, whether that's an Uber or if you need a uh, SUV and you want it personalized to yourself, when can you just walk out into the street and pick up a SUV? So, you had a question. Uh, uh, I think uh, to play off the point, we're doing a thought experiment. I kind of think that Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrency are going to be the ones Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. What you sorry? Wearable. Wearable in fashion. Shift in fashion. Yeah, it's interesting. I think like fashion really dominates the retail space too. Um, if you look, one thing that we looked at and referenced when we were at Beats was um, what Burberry was doing. They were doing full-size screens that you could literally network into a hub and you could change the content from that hub anytime you wanted to. So whether you were selling headphone A or, or dress B, you could literally change whatever content you wanted and curate that at, at retail stores. Um, well, awesome. Any other questions? Any last thoughts? Yeah. I'm going to share a little bit what you're doing now with Yamaha. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. The Yamaha is a really traditional organization. I was talking to some of the guys about this. Um, it's a really traditional organization. It's been around since like the 1800s. It's Japanese run. Um, we're a hub here in the United States, um, and it's primarily a sales organization here in the United States. Um, but I'm, I'm Yamaha now, like trying to help shift them into like more of a modern organization. 
everything from taking a, a product marketing focus to, to a brand advertising focus, because that's something that's not one of their strong suits. Um, and that's like creating a brand identity. When you think of Yamaha, you think of like dad jeans. It's, it's, I don't want to call it pathetic, but to call a horse a horse, it's, it's, it's um, not a brand that I think young consumers or modern day consumers resonate with. You think of motorcycles, you think of, yeah, you don't think of the music aspect of it. You don't think of the pianos, the guitars, and the amps, et cetera. So, it's a good question, yeah. Apple was interesting. Um, and like you will see the tone, if you look at the advertising before and after, the tone of the, of the Beast commercials are very different. Like in the past, we would use like a Richard Sherman, we use a Colin Kaepernick, um, which are very like defiant and very like loud and outspoken characters. Not saying that they're not using those characters anymore, um, but it's definitely been, I won't say, it's been muted a little bit. Um, Apple's a very big organization, naturally. They have a mass, mass appeal. Um, but I think like Beats was really, when it was, on, when it was on hot, there was nothing hotter than Beats at the time. So like, if you think about what Beats did during the World Cup, you think about like, what it's meant for like, the NFL. Um, it was, do you guys remember when Jordan wore a shoe and they banned his shoe? That's like Colin Kaepernick wearing the headphone in a Bose-owned NFL. Um, just extremely defiant, extremely like controversial. So I think now Apple's, they're doing great things. A lot of their campaigns are awesome. Um, but I think it's less out, out there than it was before. Yeah. Do you think that's like a sustainable strategy from a brand perspective? Or was that like a necessary factor to get to where it was? And then you become more of that, you know, not white label brand, but you know, that inclusive brand that accounts for the three billion yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think, like, you either die a hero or you, be, you live long enough to become the villain. That's, like, one of those things. It's, like, they kind of won, and, like, what did they just need to, like, like own it. But I imagine, like, in 10, 15, maybe 15, 20 years when Dre passes um, and, and people don't, like, maybe, like, resonate with him as much, if they don't start, like, tapping these younger influencers that will be like Dre's prodigy or whatever, um, there's going to be a new brand that's like the defiant one. Um, when we were at Beats, all of our packaging was black. It obviously had a very like awesome open box experience. The headphone was like the prize jewel in there and you wanted to save the packaging, it was played on your desk, etc. They used to call Beats the black apple in the day. And I think now because all the, all the packaging shifted over to white boxes, um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's still got the same vibe, but like, you live long enough to be the villain. <laughs> Other questions? I'm just wondering, have you worked with any small companies that kind of grow their brands and, and see what that would be like? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think small brands are challenging. Um, at the same time, they're like a little bit more exciting. Um, when I worked in the toy industry, I worked on a few small brands. Uh, Pokemon at the time wasn't a huge brand. Um, it wasn't it, what it is today, definitely. And they are typically, smaller brands are typically cash-strapped. Um, so these big like, ideas that you have at like, a bigger corporation, it's harder to execute. Um, so you really need to find ways to drive sales. You really got to like, make that ROI happen. Um, and that's, I think that's important for small brands. Yeah, your investment's got to have some type of return. It's challenging. Yeah, that's a good question. There's a question over here. Yeah, I was, I was wondering, in terms of um, finding opportunities for these with messaging and shaping brands, like, if you could explain like, a little bit of the process of how you came to Colin Kaepernick as an advisor. We got somebody here that can answer that question for us. Um, I'll take a stab at it and I'll throw it over, over the boat. Um, I think. I mean, the, the identity of Beats was like, this is not your dad's headphone. Like, that's like the attitude. Like, yeah. Every father has had a, an experience where his father told him this is not real music. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think the brand identity of Beats came from. And, and Colin Kaepernick was an unproven quarterback. Um, he had a, kind of a weird throw. And I, I don't know squat about squat for football. 
Um, but he had like a very like, this is me, like I'm going to work hard. Um, he was a quarterback that was all tatted up. Like it was a lot of people. He was not stereotypical of a court. He was no Peyton Manning for sure. Um, he wasn't that like good boy that did everything right. Um, and I think that's like one of the reasons like Beats picked him because because that's who he was. That's who his character was. Olu, Olu and I worked at Beats. He was our, our sports strategy guy. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or? Yeah, you kind of touched on some of it. I mean, he was not the stereotypical quarterback, uh, a lot of tattoos, you know, uh, African American, so catch a lot of black in some media and everything on uh, being a quarterback, tattoos and things like that. Yeah. And then also, Beats always wanted to partner with winners, and he was on 49 at the time. So um, obviously, going to go on a big two goal run, so that kind of fit. Hot in the always in the news, really good players on the field or on the court, but then always are in the news because of something else. Like uh, Kevin Gardner has another athlete who's in a commercial with him. Here's the truth. He wants to campaign. He's always in the news because of his mouth. You know, Draymond Green now is the Warriors. All-star player, but, you know, loves to talk. He's always in the news. So, I love those types of athletes. Yeah. And, uh, he causes so much to that. Yeah. That's a good question.